Have you ever driven past a green sign at the edge of a town and thought, I should stop there and take a look, find out who lives there, where they came from, and where they're going? In the next hour, we'll visit four small towns across northeastern Minnesota and find out what it means to live as a part of each community, or any community. Welcome to this town. We're happy you're here. What makes this place feel like it does? Cause we are this town, and this town is us. I like this town. I think innately we're created with the desire to want to connect with others. Um, and so a community is almost uh, the, the relationships that we build with our families, with our, our friends. I think that is really important to us in Grand Portage. The, the people here care for one another and um, look out for each other. And so we care about this place and also the people. It's a really interesting story. People were here in Grand Portage um, long before there was a state of Minnesota. The Ojibwe are traveling people. We traveled in birch bark canoes up until the 1920s, <laughs> up and down the lake and on the lakes and rivers around as far back as, as our, our um, oral histories go. This is the place where our people have been. The grandmother of my grandmother of my grandmother lived here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Drost. I'm the chairwoman in Grand Portage for the Grand Portage Band. Uh, we are here on Grand Portage Bay um, on Lake Superior. No, we can't really see Canada from here, but um, the Hat Point is right over there beyond the island, and then there's the Pigeon Point, and that would be where I guess Canada would start is two points over. Um, I think of Grand Portage as um, it is a community, and it's a, it's a village, it's a small village. Grand Portage is also um, the name of a trail, the Grand Portage, that runs right through here. And so everything around here is called Grand Portage. And the people here are known as the Grand Portage Ojibwe. The Grand Portage is about an eight and a half mile portage that has been utilized by the Grand Portage people as well as voyagers for hundreds of years. The name in our language is Gichionagaming and it means the great carrying place, the portage of carrying your canoe from Lake Superior inland around the impassable falls and rivers. It's kind of a geographic wonder, the way Grand Portage works. Yeah, my name is Carl Koster, park ranger for the National Park Service here at Grand Portage National Monument, but I'm also the man in charge of running the historical encampment. So running our annual event that celebrates the fur trade here in Minnesota and at Grand Portage particularly. See, Grand Portage has this cut through the hills that actually connects two major bodies of water. And of course, it's Lake Superior connecting to the Pigeon River. So the discovery of the Grand Portage was a connection between the water routes going all the way to the Pacific to the water routes going back to the Atlantic. Well, Grand Portage, has had visitors to it for, for a long time. For many years, people were coming through this area, but then in the 1700s, when the fur trade starts rolling, we're gonna start seeing fur traders show up here. And that number just grew and grew. And by around 1770, 1780, there were numerous fur companies in this area, especially on Grand Portage Bay. So what happened right around 1779 to 1784, a coalition of many traders gathered and formed the Northwest Company. So the Northwest Company chose this location because of its perfection. Yeah, Grand Portage kind of ends up being about eight weeks by fur trade canoe to the Atlantic and eight weeks to the Pacific. So we're basically in the center of the world here during the era of the fur trade. We got everyone. 
everyone up here from all over the country. I used to be a park ranger for the Grand Portage National Monument and I was, um, I was an interpreter. Yeah, I guess this kind of takes me back to, to giving those, those stories <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> We told the story of the fur trade here in Grand Portage and um, the Northwest companies passing through here, but we also told the story of um, the Grand Portage Ojibwe or Anishinaabe. The honor of being able to play this game in this place with these people on three days. One, two, three. Grand Portage! We've been playing historical lacrosse in the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe language that is known as Bagataue. But got away. First off, it's important to say that stickball is a Native American sport that goes back at least 1,000 years and quite likely several thousand years. So it's a very ancient game that's seen as a gift of the creator. Um, in 2000, I was a seasonal park ranger here at Grand Portage National Monument. We had our first game here at the Grand Rendezvous, so that was 19 years ago. These are a Western Great Lakes style called the Bagada Wa'an, so stick with which you play Bagada Way. They're a full hoop, and um, the game is played very similar to field hockey or actual hockey. In fact, the modern sport of hockey comes from traditional indigenous stick ball played on the ice, and over time, the balls and the sticks morphed into modern hockey. What we have in Bagataway, and at least the way we play it here at Grand Portage or Gichio Nigaming, is we have two poles. Uh, many times those were planted in the ground. Here we plant them in large stumps so that they can give and move, and you don't actually get hurt if you hit one. Bagataway is a wonderful sport. Uh, we have men and women here uh, ranging in age from, I think, 10 or 8 all the way to 70 and we also have Native American and other people playing. So it's a game that brings us together here at Grand Portage. The event here is really kind of special. I mean, there's there's people who are camping here among over 300 reenactors that gather for this event. And, you know, here we have a chance to actually celebrate something on the original site where it actually occurred. Thank you. You're Good. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy doing the history stuff, making, making froze and... Uh, just experimenting with stuff that uh, would be used in the 1700s and would be made in the 1700s and early 1800s. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. The company was active here um, until 1802. That was the last summer the big gathering was here. Uh, because, you know, what we've been talking about is a British company operating on U.S. soil illegally. So with those threats of taxation and movement, the company did have to move into Canada. So 1802 was the last great year of all that great gathering. Yeah. Grand Portage is a reservation now, today. In the 21st century, we are stewards of this little piece of land we have here. It's approximately encompassing 67,000 acres or, or so. The land was parceled out many years ago and a lot of it was sold off to others. We're very proud to have bought back over 90% of our land. <laughs> That's our tribal council office up there. It looks nice in the light. <laughs> we did have an election a few months ago and I um, was elected as the first chairwoman of Grand Portage after our longtime leader Norman Deschamps passed away in office. Once you think about it through what stories they're going to tell about you and what my daughter is going to say, you know, that's what is she's going to be able to say that forever, you know. My mom was the, the first chairwoman in Grand Portage, and you know, to be the first at something is, is kind of neat. 
I just hope that I can um, serve my people the best I can and um, do good for, for us so that, so that we can always be here. It's a huge responsibility and I don't take it, um, I take it very seriously. So Grand Portage is more than just a small community. It has a lot of interconnectedness for our family and other families who live here. Um, so if there's a way to somehow illustrate that um, to the viewers, just that connection, that interconnectedness to this, this place, this land, and that, you know, growing up here, we hunt, fish, and gather. You know, we spend time in the woods, and that's important. And that's something I want my children to be able to do, and their children to be able to do. No, wait, one, one more thing. Um, many people driving by think of this as a, a place with its great, rich history. What do you look forward to in the future that we should also be thinking about? Well, um... <laughs> Dang! Um... Uh, we're still here. This is where we've been, um, perhaps for thousands of years. And this is where we're always going to want to be. This is our homeland. And um, to have this place that we call our own, that we can raise our children here and call our own um, forever. It always just makes me emotional. <laughs> and, um, when people come to visit, they say, oh, I just love Grand Portage. And that makes me proud, too, is that people, people find this place to be a really a nice place to be and um, a good feeling. And so I think that's what I'm, I would be most proud of. This town was named sarcastically. D.H. Bacon was the first general manager of the Sudan Underground Mine. He couldn't help but notice that the weather in northern Minnesota was the exact opposite of the weather in Sudan, Africa. So he named the town Sudan. Now the extra O is an acceptable alternate spelling of Sudan. It does not stand for OMG, is it ever cold here? This town was originally called Section 22 until German realtor Frank Hibbing built a road to it. Upon his arrival in 1892, Hibbing said, I believe there is iron ore under me. My bones feel rusty and chilly. Hibbing was fine. He lived another five years. He was also correct. There was iron ore under Section 22, plenty of it and so the town of Hibbing was named after him. My name is Carol Burson. We are in Sandstone, Minnesota in Train Park. I am uh, just today finishing up a mural covering the history of the Kettle River watershed. I want the one I put in front, I want him in front of the other one, but I don't want it, so I, you know. Sandstone's a really friendly community, not just Sandstone, but the whole area. Uh, I lived in Minneapolis for 32 years and moved up here in 2014. I love how quiet it is. I think that being a person that lived in an urban area for a long time, I think that people are calmer. It's easier. It's pleasant. It's very pleasant. 
I do have a favorite story about, uh, about living in a small town. I, when I was doing research for this mural, I wanted to go over to the History Center, which is just right over there on the corner. And of course, it wasn't open. <laughs> but there was a note on the thing that said, call Irene Sandell. And she said, oh, well, you can go over to Sherry's Flower Shop and get the key and just go on in and look around. I said, well, wow, <laughs> well, I, you know, I haven't been there before and I feel a little nervous about going in all by myself. She goes, you could go get the key and then I'll meet you there tomorrow at noon. So I went to Sherry's flower shop and I said, hey, Sherry, I'm here to get the key. And oh yeah, Irene called and they gave me the key to the history museum. And I met Irene there <laughs> the next day at noon and she let me in and she showed me around and she said, well, I got gardening to do. You just look around as long as you want and when you're done, just bring me back the key. That's small town living. Well, we might as well go this way here. Yeah, okay. I'm uh, Richard Vanderwerf. Samson's always been a pretty friendly town. Well, for me it has, and that's the way the town is. I know now, one of our railroad men there, he got transferred out to <laughs> And being a Swede, he should have liked it because there's all Swedes out there, but he didn't like it at all. He said, they're kind of, they're clicky out there. I can't figure that out, but when I was a kid, we used to us kids used to go swimming down here in the river, and then we, a lot of times the, the shortcut we do we go up this here wall here. There used to be a cable part way up there, a thin cable, but we could hang on to it until we got to that ledge up there, and then from there on it was an easy cl climb uh, to the top. When we got to the top there, we were hotter than before we went swimming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think they started quarrying right in this area here. And then they worked that way. All the towns in the area uh, got started because of logging, except Sansone. In about 1885, somebody discovered this pinkish stone and there they uh, tested it out. And they found that it was uh, very, uh, very desirable. This sandstone uh, does not corrode with water going over it. It stands up real well. So then the guy, I think it was Grant, he got the quarry started. In fact, uh, by the end of the year, 1885, there's a little bit of a village uh, got started. They were talking about calling it Mineral Springs because down the river there's a great big spring on the other side which we call Mineral Springs. Great big springs, but uh, evidently the sandstone is much more logical. Sure. So that was the natural uh, name for it. And sometimes they had some hard times too. The town was about 500 people, only several hundred people worked in the quarry, but then the fire came and the uh, town had to start up all over again. Everything got burnt up. When I was a kid, there were no trees down here at all. Anyway, now you can, through the woods here, you can see that one derrick there. They had a boom, you know. They had to haul the rock up over the cliff and they did pick up the rock from one place and they'd swing it around. Although I don't think, I don't think a boom on there would be quite far enough. To, but I, I, I never did watch it working though. But I can remember it standing here. All right, up there, you can pass, you can even walk up to it. But I'm not that steady anymore, so. I, I know. Yeah. By 1910, when my grandfather came in, it was up, it was 1800 population then. And they had 600 people working in the quarry. There's a picture of my grandfather and a bunch of the guys in front of the, the old stone cutting shed. He cut out the big rocks here. I don't know if anybody enjoyed that kind of work, but it was hard work, but he came here because he had uh, friends that were here. See, back right after the Hinkley Fire in 1896, a whole bunch of Dutchmen came in. It was advertised and get this good land here. But then when the snow melted in the spring, they were pretty disappointed. Nothing but a bunch of rocks and 
But then the Scandinavians came in there and they looked at that land, hey, this is just like Sweden, Norway, you know. So they thought this is great land, and so they made a good go. But of course, these old times were used to the art of work, you know. They came over here, men, probably was no different than anything else. There's some that got the stonecutters uh, arthritis, and they and if they worked right in, the, probably in the shed or someplace, they had no mask or anything. And those people, they get this stuff down. It was a lot worse than working in a coal mine. Yo, know, the stone dust was worse. Fine dust. Yeah, fine dust there. Yeah, a lot of people died because of this place. The quarry started to, to peter out because you got uh, cement and steel, and that made it so there wasn't that much demand anymore. By 1939, we were in the fourth grade. They finally went out of business, but uh, yeah, it's too bad in a way that it went out of business. Yeah, we don't have the section gang anymore. We don't have railroad workers. and But the prison is one thing that kept the town going. So I guess we were pretty glad when the prison started up. And if you notice, coming in the town, the population says 2,800. Well, about 1,400 of them are out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the town isn't near as big. <laughs> This town has kind of been forgotten about for a while. There's always a push, I feel like, for the kids to get out of sandstone as fast as possible. Um, I'm hoping to reverse that trend in making sandstone someplace people want to move to. Sandstone could be a real hub of green tourism um, for that adventure tourism, for the hiking and the fishing and the climbing. Well, yeah, we can go over and see where they uh, do their uh, rock climbing. Is that maybe 50 feet or so? Oh, uh, that's more than that. <laughs> yeah, I'd say about 70 feet. But when I was a kid, nobody ever thought of rock climbing or ice climbing here. It's a newer sport. <laughs> it is, yeah. My name is Alex. Uh, we're at San we're in Sandstone, Minnesota, at Robinson Park, doing some rock climbing. We live in uh, Minneapolis. So we live in the cities, like the trek up. Probably like once every two-ish weeks, once or twice every two weeks. If we're trying to send this now, though. Yeah. So no one's still here. And there's a lot of good stuff here, so it's fun to come up here and work on it. Got it. You're there. So close. Boy, this next part's really easy. Yeah, come on. Nice. Yeah. Probably a while ago, I don't know when, uh, there were some people out here that would, that were like, hey, this would be good to climb. They would like ank rappel down from the top, drill in bolts, so that way you can like leave them there without having to like worry about like the them deteriorating or like worrying about the rock deteriorating. It's like not super bad for it, and then we can throw up our own gear so we can make sure that we're being safe and we're not gonna fall and die. <laughs> uh, and so we can climb it, climb it. Yeah, so I think they've been climbing here for 30 or 40 years, maybe longer, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for Minnesota, because there's, there's a lot of people that like to climb in Minnesota, but there's not a whole lot of spots to climb. Yeah, dude, you're right about some of these holds, though, they're like, so good, actually. Yeah, yeah, you like, look at it, like, like that's the, probably not gonna be super the good. The best jugs ever. And then you grab it, you're like, oh, this is really good. Yeah. Uh, if you go up north, there's a bunch of spots up there, or like down to like Blue Mounds. But other than that, there's like not a whole lot of places. There's small spots here and there, but there's a lot, there's a, for like, for Minnesota, there's a good amount of climbing here, and it's all like pretty solid climbing. Like, like the climbing is good, the rock is good. So like, it's kind of a, a good destination for it. Um, just for the Midwest, living in the plains. This is some of the best stuff we got. We get people coming in from all over for the rock climbing, but even more so for the ice climbing. Actually, 15 years ago, I started the ice climbing festival here in Sandstone, the Sandstone Ice Fest. 
myself and other climbers actually went to the city administrator at that time uh, named Sam Griffith. He was very, very open to the idea of bringing in some ice climbers. Um, if we did some volunteer work, some park cleanup kind of stuff. Um, the park was left pretty much abandoned for about 40 years. Families weren't really comfortable going down there with uh, some of the riffraff that was hanging down there. Now it's completely changed. The climbers and the paddlers and other people have kind of taken the park back. One of the north facing walls, every year there is some water freezing up that naturally forms there. Uh, when we started that first ice climbing festival, we actually pumped the water and added some more water to that wall and actually filled the whole wall up with ice, kind of showing people what the potential could be for uh, the ice farming up here in Sandstone. Now we have a reliable place to go ice climbing every year and, and it's actually spread out. People know about it all over. They know we're going to have quality ice here that has is very, very accessible to. You don't have to walk in miles to find it. It's right there outside of your car. The old history, that's important. That's you know, we can't let that go. Uh, but we're also on the verge of what the new history of Sandstone is. Everybody is online for doing something for this town. This town is kind of in a, in a sad state, bringing some tourism dollars in here. Um, everybody seems on board with that, all the businesses at least. And the whole economics of what this kind of adventure or green tourism can provide for the town, it's pretty exciting. This town was named after the Cloquet River to the north, but who named that river is a bit of a mystery. Some believe fur traders named it after a pair of French scientists, the brothers Hippolyte Cloquet and Jules Germain Cloquet. Now, Hippolyte was a rhinologist, a nose doctor, and Jules was a surgeon, an artist, and an inventor. We can only imagine which of those disciplines most impressed the fur traders. Hi, my name is Nichelle Bebo. I am part of the Bullhead Clan. I am from Leech Lake, Band of Ojibwe. I am 21 years old. I've been a part of the local Indian Council plenty of years. I was a youth rep, and now I'm the secretary treasurer. One of my favorite quotes is, be who you needed when you were younger. And I was a really shy kid around Balco, but I didn't leave my house too often unless my brother or sister was also there with me. I've thought about leaving ball club to pursue education, but I just can't bring myself to, you know, leaving. I wanna take care of my community. I wanna give back to my community. I wanna be who I needed when I was younger and, and that's okay if I wanna stay here. Okay, um, hello, or uh, boujou, um, that means hello. My name is Crystal Lindahl, and um, we're in Ball Club, Baga Adawan. Ball Club actually used to be a lacrosse court because lacrosse is a traditional sport that Native Americans play. As you know, this is a Native American community. And you know, like, I think that is really, like, really cool. Like, it's like taking something so important to our culture and having us, like, live there, having us know what it is about. I'm going to read the introduction of this book, Book of Dwa, and it's a book about ball club. There is a town on the eastern part of the Leech Lake Reservation, and its name is Ball Club, Book of Dwaning the place where you play lacrosse. Many years ago, our people would play the game on both shores of Balkle Lake, also named for the game. People traveled by horseback and canoe to play the game. They called it the healing or medicine game or the creator's game. 
when I was a youth coordinator, we had a lacrosse camp. And you know, that was the first time lacrosse has been in our community in years. We practiced in our powwow arena around there. So the importance of lacrosse and ball club, it really represents who we were and who we still are. And you know, it brings back these memories of when we had lacrosse here and let's bring it back and represent our community through lacrosse. It's really cool that we have these and makes you want to dig deeper into the history. There is not enough on the internet about ball club. Okay. So I'm looking on Wikipedia and it says the ball club, the population is 342. Ball club small economy includes a general store and gas station. And we are located on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation. Mm, this is a weird, interesting fact. See, I don't know if I believe this on here. It says, Rosanna Catherine Payne served as the post mistress for ball club. Payne served in the Minnesota House of Representatives from 1927 to 1932. Uh, <laughs> Do you not believe that? I, I've never heard that before. I actually looked that up. She was the fifth woman to serve in the Minnesota House, like ever. What? See, I did not know that. That's sort of cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm all for women in the house. Yeah, maybe I'll be there one day. That's a long 20 years, 30 years. One thing my mom always tells me is, Shell, you, you tend to go above and beyond all the time. You don't have to do that. You know, you have years to help change our community and the future of ball club is bright you know we have a lot of youth that are ready to take over and as long as we support our younger generation and our youth we're going to be the best community out there So tonight at our Ball Club Community Center, we'll be having a Circle of Healing meeting. A lot of exciting news will be shared with our community members regarding the park and our future. Yeah, the park is something that we've been working on a long time and holds a special place in my heart. And we're almost to the finish line. We're almost there. We are at the ball club park because we really want a new one. <laughs> this place used to be so big to me and my friends when we were little. That like hex, that thing over there, that could have been like a rocket ship. It could have been like where the superhero slept. It could have been anything that you wanted it to be. All you had to do is use your imagination. A lot of the time, it was a little dangerous because um, it's, it's an old park. It's a really old park, so it could break at any moment. It was starting to get worn down. They took the slide down because it broke. There's glass in the park, spray painted. The swings are breaking. So the old park is not very kid friendly. There's sand, so people with disabilities, like moi, <laughs> um, can't get in the sand. Tried. <laughs> you have tried. Yeah. Huh? How does it go? I got stuck. <laughs> Me, um, Tiona, and Chris Lynn are really the original designers of this park. We have these youth who got to work hard for the park. It's cool that we get to bring it to life. So we designed the original plan on what we wanted to have, where we wanted to have it. We came up with this idea to have a park so we wouldn't talk to some of the elders and um, leaders in our community and see what they could do to help us. Because let's talk about it's kind of the reality of this whole thing and that is that it, things are really expensive. <laughs> Just the piece alone is $20,000 and that is crazy expensive. So we have the... We have the artist Wesley May today helping us. He's an artist from Red Lake Reservation, and he's coming to our small community of ball club to help us create art for our park. All the way around again, the whole inside until we get to the center, all right? No, because like they all go together, so they're connected. See, they are connected.
He's just showing us artwork that we're going to use for the playground. Um, we've done a bunch of artwork in the summer, and he's just showing us that like our artwork matters, and it's going to be a big part of the park. And today we're doing a special piece to go on the we go round. They are getting an accessible merry-go-round called the we go round, and I think that is so cool because Taylor and I are going to be super excited about that. <laughs> like really excited. <laughs> you can take the wheelchair and roll it right on, and then. Um, lock the door and then swing her around like that is so cool. <laughs> I just love thinking about that. But the biggest thing that I love is it's in the shape of a turtle because that's my clan, Miskwadesi in Dudem. And the turtle represents wisdom. And in a story called Wainabuju, which I learned in Indian Ed, the turtle is what the earth rests upon because the muskrat went down deep and he grabbed a piece of the earth and he went back up and he risked his life and he died for it, but they took the piece of earth and they didn't know what to put it on. And the turtle said, put it on my back. It will grow on my back and it will create earth. And it did, but the turtle couldn't come back up because he's the one that supports the earth. And I think that's such a good like symbolism because it's in the shape of a turtle and it's resting upon the turtle. Yeah, the turtle means a lot, you know, and I think everyone's gonna go to the park to see the turtle. I wanna go see the, the turtle shape and I wanna see where the turtle is. There's a really big future for ball club and it's not just for like kids, like the elders can be here too. It's for everybody. It is amazing to be in such a place with amazing heritage like my ancestors could have walked this very field and they never would have known that their future great 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 kids would be designing a park and would be making a whole community filled with people who want to respect their culture. I feel super proud as a kid to be able to do this and help out with it instead of just all the adults doing everything. Like you would never think in a million years that a couple of kids could make this big thing come true, and this big dream come true. This town was named as an act of vengeance. In 1871, a Kentucky congressman objected that federal lands in northern Minnesota were being given to the St. Croix and Lake Superior Railroad for free. In a speech to Congress, he ridiculed one of the towns set to benefit from this railroad. He called Duluth a fabled Atlantis, destined to become the commercial metropolis of the universe. He was being funny. His name was J. Proctor Knott, and the town named after him is Proctor. This town was very nearly named for a woman, which makes it unusual in Minnesota. Florence Pengilly lent her name to a new town site on the east side of Shagawa Lake until her fellow townspeople discovered Minnesota already had a Florence in the opposite corner of the state. Now, they might have named the town after another local woman, but instead they named it after a man, a mining executive named Samuel Ely from Michigan. Unlike Florence, Ely never actually saw Ely, or Florence, or the team of moose that Ed Crossman trained in the winter of 1905 to lead his sleigh up and down the streets of Ely. Oh, you know, I think this is the first year that we've had a Christmas tree lit in uh, Kettle River. Oh, isn't it beautiful? You know, that's a perfect tree. Wow, there's a lot of lights on that. Dan Reed uh, decided that Kettle River should have a tree this year and he came in and set it up. Tonight, there's gonna to be a gathering around the tree. First time in Kettle River. I think it's great. Uh, 
as my idea, I said, let's put together a community Christmas tree. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Reed. We're in my garage and I use my garage for like making wreaths. We, we do spruce tops in the fall and that, but I do, uh, do wreaths for the cemetery. You, uh, you have these projects to remind people of how it was and uh, where we've come from and where we're going to go. I grew up on a farm north of Kettle River, but uh, in my childhood days, this is where I came, to Kettle River. Well, Mom would say, well, let's go to town today. And so, you know, we'd kind of dress up a little bit. We'd make a day of it. It was so vibrant. There was always something going on. Well, you know, there was a, bit, a business in every spot. This is the co-op mercantile store and the Castsack brothers, they had a lumber yard. My family would have their Thanksgiving dinners here because we were such a large family. And then there would be the CAP down there. But this is the original building right here. You can tell, yeah. Kettle River has been called the most cooperative town in all of Minnesota because they had nine 10, 11 cooperative businesses. And I don't think many of the other cities did. The co-op system is an interesting system. I think a co-op is when everybody chips in. Like all of these businesses that were started here, they sold shares. So when the business makes money, each person that has shares there, they make a certain amount of profit off of each of those shares. $7,500 in refund. Well, this is their refund that they were, they had this much money, they were going to be returning to the owners, the shareholders. Yeah, the owners and the customers are the same people. Well, the, the co-ops were, were uh, an idea that had, uh, had come from socialist roots. There was some connotation sometimes, right? Well, you could throw a lot of labels around. Some people who weren't using it or in it, well, that's communist. I don't know where they got the idea, frankly, but. The Finns brought the idea of the co-ops with them from Finland. And uh, I am the local storyteller or uh, the Finns call it a kalle. It's a way of perpetuating stories that have come from the old ones. People ask, well, why did, was this, why did the Finns and a lot of the Scandinavians come here? Well, it is true that this area looks very much like Finland, for example. It's uncanny how much the, uh, the woods and everything is the same unless you really start to look. Uh, I heard the story of my great-grandmother and her first husband, they were dislocated like a lot of Finns, a lot of Scandinavians were because of the effects of the Industrial Revolution. The, the big factories in that took over, making everything from shoes to clothes to whatever. And so the village as a unit, there was no need for that village. So literally whole villages from the northern part of Scandinavia left. They all, all, all came to America so, because supposedly there was opportunity. You know, the Finnish people have sisu, and that's the determination to get it done. And I think that's what a lot this town was built on. Okay, these are pictures that were taken of the cooperative businesses. Many were taken. Kettle River is rather unique. I was listing them here. They had about uh, at least 10 co-op ventures in the, local, in the local area. This is the REA. This is the beginning of Lake Country Power. This is the original creamery. The locker plant, the feed store, the CAP, the mercantile. We're at six. And then my, the CAP had the trucking company the credit union that was mentioned, the cooperative of Calavella Hall, the uh, service station, 
And of course, the first one was the cooperative telephone. People here did not need to go shopping anywhere else because everything was here. Just about every phase of their life was covered by a cooperative store of some sort. Of course, I'm very proud of that. I lived through it. This was our town. And I didn't tell you about on the other side of the tracks, that was called Finland. But then because there is another Finland in our state, it was decided to name it Kettle River. And why Kettle River? Well, that's what the Indians were calling it, but they, their, their uh, name for it was Akiko Sebe, which means kettles, Kettle River. Uh, somewhere along the, the river itself, there is a spot where the rock is, uh, has holes in it, you know, and it looks like a pot, so, or a kettle. So that's how it came to be named Kettle River. Yeah. This is the, uh, what I always called the co-op cemetery. Yeah, that sign says the Kettle River Cemetery. Some of the local lore is that it's the communist cemetery or the socialist cemetery. You got this on tape. This is a great story. There is a cemetery north of town, which was, has been called the Communist Cemetery, right? Yeah. It's that classic story on the east side of the river is Holy Trinity Lutheran Cemetery. Uh, the co-op people aren't going to go in the Lutheran Cemetery. So they bought this piece of ground not too far down the road, and there's not a lot of people in there but they are a collection of uh, those that are here. The uh, Kakkonens are probably the most famous because the old man Kakkonen went and sent a couple of the boys to uh, Russia as part of this to the workers paradise thing of the 19 1930s and uh, they never came back from there. There was uh, support for uh, the socialist uh, dream. Some people overlooked the communist dictatorship thing, uh, hoping for some socialist utopia. But that ended abruptly when uh, Russia invaded Finland. <laughs> and nobody talked about it anymore. So the local lore was that uh, that uh, the boys had smuggled out a letter from communist Russia and said that uh, if they ever get out of there, they were gonna come home and kill the old man. So now it doesn't make any difference anymore because they're gone and the old man lays here. And, uh, but there's the story. Actually, I prefer to have hand tied, but the, uh, but uh, you work with what you got. You know, people throw the name communist around all the time. They, you know, I, I knew some communists. I remember in the family, my grandfather was the postmaster in uh, Atamba. The feds would come and they would say, well, who's getting the 2MES paper, the, the workers' paper, who's the communist Bolsheviks here locally in that? And, and Grandpa Reed had to provide a list. Pull one stem along farther so you can have an overlap. You throw a cedar in there just for eye candy. Uh, one of my elementary school teachers and her husband, they were hauled up for questioning in Duluth at the federal building. We were all horrified, you know. They're, they're just good people like co-op people, but good like anybody else. But that one looks, looks that pretty good. Okay. We were co-op people, uh, uh, participated in many of the co-ops. My father was on the co-op store board, uh, always went to co-op annual meetings. Some people uh, 
lost some friendships over some people being strong co-op and strong socialists and some were just trying to make a living, you know. I didn't want to get into the political dialogue there. Couldn't understand the madness of it all, you know. But that co-op cemetery there was put there uh, because uh, they wanted to have their own ground where they were put. Change is not always easy. The war years were real good to the farmers and into the late 40s and that until 1953 when uh, Eisenhower got in and he had a agriculture secretary. His name was Ezra Taft Benson. Oh, I heard his name spoken often. And uh, Ezra Taft Benson was strictly against farm subsidies, any of that sort of thing. And so he convinced Eisenhower in 53 to d drop the milk support price in half. The rural areas emptied out overnight. Yeah, they started going Moose Lake, Cloquet, and even to Duluth. And I know when I'd find out that they, something else had closed, yes, it hurt. It hurt because, you know, it was such a grand town those many years in the 40s. Yeah, so I miss them. But here I am, you know, with, I brought all my pictures today. I hang on to those pictures because they're dear to me. You know, I want the younger people to see what Kettle River has gone through, through the years. Because our ancestors did so much work, did so much to get it going that we don't want to lose that. We want to keep it going. Put Kettle River on the map. Let everybody know we're here. Uh, Santa? Yes? Are you going to come out of this building too? I, yeah, probably. Okay. You know what? I think that Christmas is a very special time. I hope that people will say that yeah, we, we came tonight to celebrate us as a community and that hope for the future. We're now at a time when Kettle River is just a bedroom community, but you need those kind of things to build community. Nice when a dream comes true. The rebuilding a Kettle River. Thanks for spending some time in this town. Don't be a stranger. Stop by any time. I like this town. It feels like me. The little shops along Main Street, the water tower, where if you squint your eyes, you still can see a faded class of 65. It's important to be a part of a community because we all take care of each other here and we all want to be there for each other and we always want to count on each other. You got to know where you came from, who you are, what makes you who you are. And, uh, and community, you all get to be like family. It just comes back to home and family, um, a way of life. We have a lot of 
um, our band members who don't live here either. Um, and so we're all over the place, uh, but we always call this place home. And I hope that we always can. I think a community, a good community is one where the people work together. And this is one thing about the cooperative uh, movement too was no one felt that they should get more than somebody else. Everybody was equal. They had all, you know, bought the shares into the businesses. They all owned it together. They could all make the decisions together. It's just cooperating with one another that no one is better than another person, I think. Now this town it lives, and I believe when they say the heart of America, this is what they mean. It's in my blood, in each and every bone. It doesn't matter where I am, I still call this town home. There's a lot of towns with a lot of names. Many look alike. None are quite the same. What makes this place feel like it does? Is we are this town, and this town is us. I like this town.